This information is from Wisconsin's Green Fire, Voices for Conservation, a new organization formed to support the conservation legacy of Wisconsin by promoting science-based management of its natural resources. One of our priorities is sharing knowledge about the relationship between agriculture and water quality. This is one of several presentations and documents on this subject available through our website. My name is Paul La Liberty, a charter member of Wisconsin's Green Fire. I retired from DNR in 2016 after 36 years working in water programs. This information drew from the experience of water quality and public health scientists from DNR and the university system, as well as agricultural conservation experience from Wisconsin Department of Agriculture and county conservation departments who are listed here. Our team members are volunteers choosing to provide decision makers with the current science and relationship between cropping practices and water quality. Our intent is to share this material with anyone wishing more information or seeking to influence policies related to agriculture and water quality. It's geared towards audiences anywhere in the state with a wide range of backgrounds from concerned citizens and elected officials to agricultural and water quality professionals. Our talk will therefore start basic and advance to important technical detail. A wide variety of factors influence the relationship between agriculture and water quality. To encourage sustainable farming, society needs to foster an economic system that allows responsible farmers to make a living. Achieving environmental goals on most farms can be costly and farms cannot shift environmental costs to their markets. There are significant costs associated with agriculture that farmers and consumers of agricultural products are transferring to others in the form of poor quality groundwater and surface water. Society needs to decide the extent to which it will provide financial assistance to address these deferred costs. Society needs to decide the extent to which it will assist farmers who want to adopt conservation practices but can't afford them and reward farmers already meeting performance standards, especially those achieving water quality standards. This needs to include accountability to treat farmers fairly and to ensure cost-effective use of public funds. Society needs to decide the extent to which it will enforce compliance on farms that willfully refuse to adopt or maintain performance standards despite having available resources to do so. Included alongside all these social factors is the application of science to decision making. This is the primary purpose of this Wisconsin's Green Fire presentation, to make available science that informs farmers and policymakers when statewide minimum practices will still allow local environmental impacts. These are the take home messages from this presentation. The rest of the slides will provide supporting information for these messages. Uh, the first one is that Wisconsin has water quality problems in surface water. Agriculture plays an important role as both a source and a solution. Significant improvements are possible if existing practices are more widely adopted. And there are problems with Wisconsin's existing performance standards. Phosphorus is an element essential for all life, in our bodies and in our food. It's a finite resource on the planet. It must be mined for agricultural purposes. It's estimated that U.S. reserves will last about another 50 years and then the country will rely on imports from the Western Sahara and Morocco. It's sometimes necessary to add phosphorus to agricultural lands for good production, but loss of even small amounts has significant effects on water bodies. Water bodies are a function of their watershed. The water cycle connects them through surface runoff and groundwater flow. The priority of crop nutrient management has been meeting the needs of agriculture without wasteful over application. 
even when followed, it can still result in phosphorus loss to water bodies by surface runoff. Most phosphorus is transported to surface water during bigger runoff events, either attached to silt and clay or dissolved in runoff or drainage water. Climate change is predicted to cause more rain to fall in fewer larger events, which translate into more runoff potential. Phosphorus grows algae in surface water, which sometimes releases a toxin. In addition to aesthetic effects, there are human health effects associated with these toxins. You see them listed here, along with a copy of a warning sign that county public health departments are increasingly posting on Wisconsin water bodies. Algal toxins cause these symptoms in wild and domestic animals. Some animals have died. Algae blooms have also led to fish kills through oxygen depletion, uh, sometimes called dead zones, and have been implicated in frog deformities. DNR data on aquatic life impairments shows that among rivers and streams, 59% were monitored. Of them, 19% were found impaired. And of this impairment, 67% were due to phosphorus. For impoundments, 92% were monitored. 59% of those were impaired. And of those impairments, 91% were caused by phosphorus. For lakes, 85% were monitored. 33% of those were impaired. And of those impairments, 62% were caused by phosphorus. While agriculture is important to Wisconsin's economy, so is tourism. The costs to society from algae problems include health costs and water treatment costs at Lake Winnebago and Great Lakes cities. A study documented that three feet of water clarity in Wisconsin lakes is worth twenty to $30,000 in individual lakefront property value. A UW Stout study in the city of Menominee determined that if Lake Menomen were clean enough for recreation in the summer, the economic benefit from UW Stout students remaining in town for the summer would be $2.6 million a year. Water-based tourism is significantly affected by public perceptions of water quality. The top three factors influencing people's choice of lakes to visit were safety from contamination, water clarity, and lack of color. These water quality considerations outweighed factors related to fish and wildlife. Now we'll move on to the role of agriculture. The majority of waters listed by DNR as phosphorus or sediment impaired are due either from non-point sources alone or combined with municipal and industrial point sources. Since 1995, Wisconsin point sources reduced phosphorus discharges to the Mississippi River by 67% and to Lake Michigan by 54%. This slide, summarizes all phosphorus sources flowing down the Wisconsin River. Background concentrations are in green. Agricultural nonpoint sources in gold are important because of the large acreage it covers versus urban and residential areas, including septic systems, which are the pink shades. Point sources are in purple. These trends in agriculture do not bode well for improving water quality. The Wisconsin average soil test phosphorus for cropland, an indicator of soluble phosphorus stored in the soil, increased for decades and remains high. The average soil erosion rate has been increasing since the 1990s. Phosphorus moves with the soil. The size of dairy farms is increasing in response to market demands to produce more milk at lower costs. 3% of Wisconsin farms produce 40% of Wisconsin milk. A 1,000 cow dairy produces a quantity of waste equivalent to that of the city of Stevens Point, or about 25,000 people. Most phosphorus 
applied in Wisconsin is chemical fertilizer. This graph does not include other uh, minor organic phosphorus sources, which are much smaller on a statewide level, but can be locally important. It's important to note that there's plenty of Wisconsin cropland available for application of manure. Wider distribution of manure would reduce the import of phosphorus into the state. Concentrating manure in smaller areas of Wisconsin complicates the task of keeping phosphorus losses low in these areas. Hauling costs incentivize application above crop need in some areas setting the stage for serious environmental problems. Parts of the state without local manure supplies must import chemical phosphorus. The more manure generation becomes centralized, the greater the challenge of long distance transportation. Wisconsin has statewide minimum agricultural performance standards listed here. This presentation focuses on the two listed in white but it's important to recognize the entire list. While the performance standards apply to all farms, enforcement can only occur uh, at CAFOs or where required by government incentive programs or local ordinances or where cost share is made available. The Agriculture Department estimates 37% of farm acreage prepares nutrient management plans, and there's no statewide system for determining compliance on farms. A nutrient management plan includes routine soil testing and fertilizer rate recommendations, plus runoff phosphorus loss and erosion rate estimators. These additions make a nutrient management plan more comprehensive than a typical soil test report. Inside the nutrient management plan is the Wisconsin Phosphorus Index. It's intended to address phosphorus. It estimates the average phosphorus delivered from a field to a stream given long-term weather patterns, and it evaluates alternative management practices. The white text is a list of Wisconsin Phosphorus Index factors outside the control of farmers and the black text are controllable factors. Together, they determine the amount of phosphorus lost to surface water. Included in the statewide expectations was an individual field maximum Wisconsin Phosphorus Index, or WPI, of six as an average over a crop rotation which is a two to eight year sequence of crops that will be repeated on a field, and 12 in an individual year. These goals were intended to be a starting point for management and not an end point applicable everywhere. A statewide limit of a WPI of six can be compared to a statewide speed limit of 70, unacceptable to exceed anywhere. The need for lower WPI values in sensitive watershed was recognized in the 2010 rule package that created the WPI. They were called targeted performance standards and must be passed into law before they apply. So why did the effort on phosphorus stop here in 2010? Well, in 2010, the statewide phosphorus water quality standard was just being established. And the ability to relate a WPI to the water quality standard did not exist. There's very little information about the distribution of WPI values around the state. And only 17% of farm acreage had a nutrient management plan and therefore a Wisconsin phosphorus index speedometer. Now in 2018, there are 26 counties and a substantial number of towns that include nutrient management plans in their manure ordinances. There are more Wisconsin phosphorus inventory information available, uh, now up to 37% of farms. 
and there's been progress on using the WPI to target efforts. We have more farms with nutrient management plans or speedometers. The red areas on these maps illustrate the distribution of fields with a WPI greater than six in three watersheds. You can see they are a small percent of the watershed areas. In this watershed, fields with a WPI over six are 3% of the area and 12% of the phosphorus load. These are a great place to start, but work on lower WPI fields is also necessary if water quality is going to be protected. Given that just enforcing the statewide maximum of a WPI of six is unlikely to remove phosphorus impairments, what can be done? This brings us to our next topic. Significant improvements are possible if existing practices are more widely adopted. In Pleasant Valley, there was a 10 year study in two adjacent 12,000 acre watersheds. Cropland WPI uh, greater than six was 14% of the area and 39% of the load. The average Wisconsin phosphorus index was 4.2. Some pastures also had very high phosphorus index. The treatment watershed included work on cropland, pastures, and barnyards. Uh, there were no manure storage structures in these watersheds. And most importantly, they targeted areas where the phosphorus index was above three. This is, study is an example of the appropriate use of Wisconsin phosphorus index and has been documented with stream monitoring. The study is complicated, expensive, and rarely done. The results? Two thirds of the fields above a WPI of three participated. This was a voluntary program. Uh, phosphorus loss decreased 50% more in the treatment watershed than in the control watershed. Farmers converting to no-till on fields greater than three often did likewise on fields less than three for simplicity. CRP acres decreased almost 20% and animal units declined 34% in the treatment watersheds. The yellow events represent complicating factors in watershed work. Conversion of CRP land to agriculture would be expected to increase phosphorus losses, while loss of livestock would decrease manure generation and associated phosphorus loss. The use of a nearby paired watershed allowed the study to compensate for these complications. My last topic is improvement of the ability to develop locally appropriate Wisconsin Phosphorus Index values. In 2018, the science has developed to identify WPI values for individual watersheds. Wisconsin River Total Maximum Daily Load Study, or TMDL, is the most recent of its kind and the first to include not only watershed-specific phosphorus reduction needs uh, to address the red impaired water bodies you see on this map, but also a mechanism to apply those needs to nutrient management plans. It covers a large portion of agricultural land in Wisconsin. It individually analyzed 337 watersheds called subbasins here. And it identified where the phosphorus is coming from, looking both at agricultural runoff and municipal and industrial point sources. In the Wisconsin River Basin, we now know what it will take each watershed to meet water quality needs downstream. 
These are watershed average values, not individual field maxima, which complicates promulgating them into law. However, they can be used as goals in voluntary efforts similar to Pleasant Valley. Can these goals be met? The details of how this is done is coming from the experience of visionary farmers, Procedures and experts in methods for profitably farming at low PI values are available. They include practices like cover crops that were not emphasized in the Pleasant Valley project. So in conclusion, Wisconsin has water quality problems in surface water. While phosphorus comes from multiple sources, agriculture plays an important role as a source and a solution. Significant improvements are possible if existing practices are more widely adopted. And the, the existing performance standards for phosphorus do not adequately protect water quality and need to incorporate recent science. We have some recommendations, uh, and that's to encourage proper use of nutrient management plans, to emphasize the importance of phosphorus index goals lower than six, and to work with the phosphorus index developers to add farm-wide weighted average phosphorus index and soil loss values for nutrient management plans to improve our speedometers. Thank you for taking the time to view this presentation. You can send questions and comments to this email address. The literature used in this presentation is listed on the following slides.